In the early 90s and early 2000s, you could not think of Nickelodeon without thinking of the name Klasky Chupo. While I'm sure most of you jump to certain yellow sponges, elemental martial arts, or boy geniuses, Nickelodeon is very much the house that Rugrats built, and Klasky Chupo was the seemingly unstoppable powerhouse behind it. They would go on to create an additional five shows for Nickelodeon, including All Real Monsters, The Wild Thornberries, and Rocket Power, just to name a few. But the massive influence and success of Rugrats, as one of Nickelodeon's greatest hits, turned out to have a rocky foundation. With this legendary 90s animation studio toppling down due to intense creative differences, what exactly happened to tear down such a popular studio? Well, stick around to find out. This is a story filled with divorce, colleagues fighting, and executive shakeups, all which lead to the downfall of one of the most prominent studios in animation history. So let's find out what ruined Klasky Chupo. But before we start, two things. One, please subscribe to the channel if you'd like. And two, a quick shout out to this video sponsor. Badood! Magic Spoon is a high protein cereal that the adult and inner child in you will love. Folks, do you remember the old days of watching Saturday morning cartoons and munching on a bowl of cereal? Yeah, good times. Better times, I say. Well, grab a box of Magic Spoon and take your 30-year-old ass back in time. That's, that's me talking to me. I'm, I'm going back in time. For those who don't know, Magic Spoon cereal has 0 grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and only 4 to 5 net grams of carbs in each serving. And all of these flavors are only 130 calories per serving. It's also keto-friendly, grain-free, gluten-free, soy-free, and full of natural flavors. For me, personally, my favorite is the peanut butter by a long shot. But I gotta say, I also love the cocoa and fruity flavors too. Oh, and guess what? Magic Spoon is launching a new product called Treats! Aptly named because I'm finding myself running downstairs during the day and grabbing a bar like twice, you know, three times sometimes. I'm not proud to say this box was destroyed in a single day. Each treat bar has 11 grams of protein, 1 gram of sugar, 1 to 2 net carbs, and are only 130 calories each. A perfect snack throughout the day or before or after a workout. So click the link down below to get some Magic Spoon cereal today and to check out their new treats. Make sure to check out both delicious protein-packed flavors. Marshmallow and chocolatey peanut butter. Oh, I, I, I love ya marshmallow, but chocolatey peanut butter is my fave. Whether you like to stick to the classics or try something new, there's always a flavor you'll love. And just like with their cereal, Magic Spoon is so confident in their product, it's backed with 100% happiness guaranteed. So if you don't like it for any reasons, they will refund your money, no questions asked. So click the link down below and use code SABER for $5 off. Or go to magicspoon.com slash saber to save $5 off your order today. Also for my Canadians and British viewers, Magic Spoon is now shipping to Canada and the UK, so go hit them up. All right, on that note, back to the video. To understand Klasky Chupo, we have to understand the dynamic between its two founders, Arlene Klasky and Gabor Chupo, a married couple who began the company out of their spare bedroom and their Hollywood apartment. Arlene was a California native and grew up in the beach towns of Orange County. It was this environment that would familiarize her with surfing, later serving as the main inspiration for their show, Rocket Power. But hey, let's not get ahead of ourselves. The Shubies can wait. Shubies. Gabor Chupo was born and raised in Hungary before fleeing communism to Stockholm, Sweden. It was there he would by chance meet Arlene, who was vacationing there at the time. The two would hit it off with Gabor immigrating to the United States in the late 1970s. Gabor and Arlene got married in 1979 and settled down in Hollywood, with Gabor beginning a job working as an animator for Hanna-Barbera. He animated on short-lived TV shows like Scooby and Scrappy-Doo and The World's Greatest Super Friends, before starting Klasky Chupo with Arlene out of the second bedroom in their apartment in 1982. Much of Klasky Chupo's early work would consist mainly of advertising, including logo designs, film trailers, and promo spots. Their first big break would come in 1987, when they would begin animating a series of one-minute shorts about a family for the Tracy Ullman show. That family's name? Hmm. That's right! Without Bart, Lisa, Homer, Marge, and Maggie, 
we probably would not have such a major pillar of Nickelodeon success story. It's crazy to think, but those one-minute Simpsons shorts are sort of a springboard for so much to come in the following decades. Despite being such a short, recurring segment, they would frequently be the most popular part of the Tracy Ullman show. This actually caused some friction on the show itself, with Ullman growing irritated at being upstaged on her own show by the cartoon. As reported in a Variety article from October 1992, Ullman actually tried to sue 20th Century Fox, as she wanted merchandising royalties related to The Simpsons being featured on her Variety show. She claimed their original contract involved awarding her 5-10% to of net receipts for series characters depicted on the show. This would have amounted to roughly over $2 million, or about $5 million today. Damn, inflation really is just that bad these days. However, the judge dismissed the claims, as she had no real involvement in their creation, as they were developed by cartoonist Matt Groening. The demand was there for a clever animated sitcom, as Fox moved to make The Simpsons its own independent series. And, well, the rest is history. In 1989, the world was introduced to our favorite yellow nuclear family. To deal with the drastic change in workload, Klasky Chupo would handle the character and background layout with most of the color, tweening, and filming being handled by Acom, an animation contractor in South Korea. Here at Klasky Chupo in Hollywood, a brilliant team of artists create that special Simpsons look. After the uh, voice tracks are done, uh, we use uh, both the script and the track to come up with the images that we need to tell the story. This working relationship wouldn't last forever, though. Tensions arose when Gracie Films, the Simpsons production company, wanted to instill their own producer, Citing dissatisfaction with Klasky Chupo's producer, put in charge of the production of The Simpsons. Gabor took this as Gracie Films telling him how to run his business, which he did not take well. Klasky Chupo would exit The Simpsons after season three. Losing their contract was a massive financial blow to the company, resulting in Klasky Chupo having to lay off two thirds of the staff, losing 75 of their original 110 animators. Now, I know that it sounds like I'm laying out a lot of this at Gabor's feet. And to be fair, Arlene very well could have had a hand in this decision as well. For all intents and purposes, it does seem like they captained this ship together. But in a lot of my research about this time frame at the studio, Gabor seems to be the direct mouthpiece for the company. Or at the very least, he was the most vocal about calling the shots, which paints him in a new light to me. On one hand, I can appreciate that he wanted to run their business the way he saw fit. After all, The Simpsons was a giant success, uh, so surely there was something to the way they were doing things. On the other hand, though, why would you purposely bite the hand that feeds you, especially when you're risking the livelihood of more than half of your workforce over a power play? At its core, the animation industry is a highly collaborative one, and you have to be able to compromise sometimes. But this dark period would not last long for Klasky Chupo. In 1991, a little channel called Nickelodeon was beginning to take shape with the goal of being the very first all-kids network. Nickelodeon wanted to differentiate their cartoons from others on the scene that were seemingly only there to sell stuff to kids. No, Nickelodeon would be different with their Nicktoons, seeking to create great shows with substance for children that also put the reins back into the hands of the creators, not the advertisers. <laughs> oh, oh God, how the mighty and noble have fallen. Nickelodeon's creatively bankrupt nowadays, huh? The first round of Nicktoons would include Jim Jenkins' Doug, John Kay's, yeah, uh, Rin and Stimpy, and of course, Arlene and Gabor's Rugrats. Now, we've already done a What Ruined Rugrats video where I break down what the show is in depth. So, uh, for now, I won't beat that drum again. But for a brief overview, Rugrats is a show about a group of babies trying to make sense of the world around them through the power of their imaginations. You've got Tommy, our main character, Chucky, his kind but cowardly BFF, Phil and Lil, our gross-out comedic relief, and of course, the main antagonist and Tommy's older cousin, Angelica. These children would be the main cast for a while, until the introduction of Dill, Tommy's baby brother, and Kimmy, Chucky's stepsister, during two of the three Rugrat movies. Yep, you heard that right. Three movies. A trilogy of toddlers taking the world by a storm. If you weren't around in the 1990s, 
It's hard to describe what a massive cultural phenomenon Rugrats was for Nickelodeon. It was absolutely everywhere. For a modern example, I compare it to being as heavily marketed as Frozen is now. Everything from holiday specials, figures, dolls, party supplies, school supplies, even mac and cheese with baby-shaped noodles. Hell, the soundtrack to the first movie has no doubt and Buster Rhymes in it, which charted at 19 on the Billboard Hot 100. Rugrats were everywhere, and more importantly, were launching Klasky Chupo into meteoric success. The crazy part is that Rugrats wasn't even their only Nicktoons in those early days, with Ah! Real Monsters launching in 1994. If a slice of life story about babies isn't your thing, there's always creepy monsters terrorizing New York City with armpit hair and giant lips jumping out of the toilet. You know, something for everyone. The show was popular enough for four seasons, running from October 1994 to November 1997. But with massive success comes the opportunity for massive missteps. And oh boy, did the success of Rugrats create a lot of missteps. I previously covered some of this information in the What Ruined Rugrats vid, but it's important context for this topic. So, Arlene and Gabor were the namesakes behind the company, and both were integral to their branding. It seems like it was just the two of them behind Rugrats as a series, and Nickelodeon went out of their way to make you think that. But no, there was a mysterious third collaborator, who I would argue was just as responsible for not just the success of the show, but in giving it its voice. And that person is Paul Germain. Paul was brought on as a writer for the initial 65-episode run for Rugrats, and felt that like they could be doing more to give the characters depth and personality. While rewatching a few episodes of the show before writing this review, I actually found myself appreciating the quality of the scripts and the humor even more as an adult. Like, there's some really good, uh, mature humor in this show. Sure, I loved the imaginative scenarios of the kids experiencing the world in their own naive way. But mostly, I was blown away at how well a lot of the humor has aged, especially from the early seasons. Like, how can you not think of this meme when you're completely exhausted late at night? Stu, what are you doing? Making chocolate pudding. It's four o'clock in the morning. Why on earth are you making chocolate pudding? Because I've lost control of my life. Here's your pudding, Angelica. Oh, that's okay, Uncle Stu. I'm not hungry anymore. Paul also believed that opposition, more importantly bullying, was such a critical part of childhood that they'd be doing their audience a disservice by not addressing it. So he came up with the character of Angelica, who was based on his own childhood bully growing up. But this caused some friction with Arlene, who found Angelica to be too mean-spirited for the kind and sweet show she wanted to make. She also found that Jermaine and the other writers wanted to make the babies too grown up. As in, she did not like seeing them in situations that she found too unbelievable. Which is kind of like... <laughs> Hilarious, because isn't that, like, the whole point of the show? Yeah, I, uh, I don't agree with you there, Arlene. I don't know how many of you guys have been around real babies before, but, uh, they're pretty boring. They, they, they don't make for compelling television. Fight! 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 Baby fights! Anyway, these disagreements would apparently get really tense. Eyes would turn to Gabor, who was expected to play mediator and make sure things stay civil. Now, if you read any interviews with Gabor where he talks about the creative process, he often mentions the importance of nailing down the script. Here's a snippet from an interview with Hype and Hyper, with Gabor discussing it during his time working on The Simpsons. Quote, During the production of The Simpsons, we learned how important a quality script is, showing the layers of our characters to capture the audience, and providing little snippets that would make them feel included in the story. We thrive to come up with characters and storylines that would also interest us as adults sitting in an armchair in front of our TVs. Our goal has always been to create intriguing characters, rich storylines, humor, and emotional connection. You can use the latest, most interesting design elements in your work, but what's the point if it doesn't have a soul?" End quote. So, uh, probably surprising no one. Gabor tended to side with Paul Germain and his other writers over Arlene most of the times. And one major roadblock that drove them apart was Tommy's cousin, Angelica. She was more than just a spoiled brat. 
As reported in a New Yorker article by writer Mimi Schwartz, Angelica was an incredibly contentious character in the writer's room, with a lot of arguments stemming over how to handle her in the series. Arlene was insistent that she was too mean and cruel, with her nasty behavior being played for laughs. Angelica represented an obvious sore spot within the show that she had no interest in expanding on. However, Paul argued getting into her backstory and establishing the depth of her behavior was necessary. He claimed that she was the result of emotional neglect by her self-absorbed parents, Drew and Charlotte, who gave her everything except for their attention. Even with Gabor taking his side, though, Paul and the other writers would eventually leave the show. Now, we'll never know the exact specifics of what went down, as things got so bad it ended up in a court settlement, but Rugrats would continue on, though albeit in a lesser form than it was and when Jermaine was on board, or at least so in the eyes of a lot of fans. Despite all this chaos, though, Rugrats really exploded in popularity after it hit syndication in 1994. There were no new episodes airing, so the network was relying on reruns. But those episodes consistently reached some incredible highs for Nickelodeon. At its peak, Rugrats was hitting 26 million viewers a week. For contrast, that's roughly a quarter of the views that the Super Bowl received in 2023. So yeah, we're talking a certified hit. It's also important to note that Gabor and Arlene ultimately ended their marriage, divorcing in 1995. But to their credit, they still continued to work together for many years to come. After the huge boost in ratings for the show, they went right back to work on new Rugrats episodes in 1996. The two of them seemed very uninterested in airing their dirty laundry to the world, which is honestly fair. However, in an interview with the New York Post leading up to the release of Rugrats in Paris and Rocket Power, both Arlene and Gabor eventually opened up slightly about the situation. They admitted that their relationship actually became a lot easier because they were no longer bringing their baggage from work back home. Not wanting to reveal too much, Arlene stated, quote, We basically share the same vision, creatively. I think we trust each other. We have good reason to stay together as partners. And I bet if you really looked in the world, it's not that unusual. Where people like us do manage to work together. It's not that hard. Taking this kind of mature and diplomatic approach is important especially as they had two young children together and almost certainly wanted to keep things private to avoid public scrutiny. I mean, let's be honest. In an age of family YouTubers oversharing everything to strangers online, this kind of restraint is incredible to see, especially in the early 2000s. Gabor continues saying, quote, We're very good friends. We share children and we respect each other. People are always trying to dig up dirt, but there's really nothing to hide. We have a very good, friendly relationship. That's what everyone should know. Frankly, I think this is an excellent way of approaching conflict, too. Working with a close friend or a loved one can be a really positive experience because you have an understanding of how they think and their best strengths as a worker. But there's a delicate balance to it. Boundaries and communication are critical because it can get a lot more stressful with that lingering emotional component along with expectations from a larger company. Innocuous criticisms can feel like personal attacks if you're not careful. It takes both mutual respect and honesty from both sides to make things easier to deal with. Now, I'm glad they were able to work things out, even if they couldn't be together anymore. It's genuinely really refreshing. So massive props to them for figuring it out. So, Rugrats reigned supreme in Nickelodeon during the early 90s. But what about Klasky Chupo as a company? What else were they involved with outside of that? Honestly, quite a lot. They've never been short on work, creating commercials for over 120 different companies over the years. Now, I had not realized this at the time, but they were also involved in a ton of different smaller projects. Promotional bumpers, music videos, and even TV show intros, like the original 21 Jump Street series, and my personal favorite of theirs, In Living Color. I swear, this theme song is still such a bop, and I distinctly remember watching the reruns on Comedy Central back in the day. God, I'm old. But independent of that, Klasky Chupo is also trying to explore the world of adult animation. With the widespread appeal of The Simpsons showing a clear demand for more programming, they decided to team up with independent cartoonist Everett Peck. 
he wanted to bring his one-shot comic character, Duckman, to the small screen and enlisted Klasky Chupo to help produce and animate the show. Portrayed by Jason Alexander, a.k.a. George Costanza from Seinfeld, the premise follows a foul-mouthed, perverted duck, working as a private detective and living with his extended family in Los Angeles. With a slew of memorable and bizarre side characters, Duckman quickly gained a cult following and ultimately had four seasons. Airing from March 5th, 1994, until September 6th, 1997, with a jokey cliffhanger ending. Fans still looking for more content could check out the point-and-click adventure game that came out in May 1997. Because yes, that was a trend that happened with movies and TV shows in the 1990s. Nowadays, you just get Candy Crush knockoffs. Is it better though? Was this, was this a better thing to have before? Nah, <laughs> it wasn't, but it's definitely cheaper. And that is what matters the most these days. Surprisingly, a Duckman was the most successful venture Klasky Chipo had outside of children's entertainment, eventually earning three nominations at the Primetime Emmys. They had tried to branch out, developing two short series geared more towards adults, but both of them were incredibly short-lived and poorly received by critics. Santo Baguito was a Tex-Mex-themed show about bugs living in a border town that had one season airing on CBS from September 1995 to August 1996. Across the pond, they developed Stressed Eric for BBC Two with creator Carl Gorham, but were only involved in the first season, later being replaced by Varga Studio based in Budapest, Hungary. <laughs> what a twist! Being swapped from one partly Hungarian studio to another. It might not be a foul play, but it is pretty coincidental. Then there's a 1996 Jumanji animated series, based on the classic children's book and the 1995 live-action children's film starring Robin Williams. Huh. Well, how about that? Klasky Chupo actually had nothing to do with this show. What? H how is that possible? Just look at it. We're Klasky Chupo core here. So initially, I wanted to get my conspiracy board out for this one, hoping there was some widespread theories about what went down or, or corporate meddling from the top. But no, it has a straightforward, boring answer, which is substantially less fun. It's mostly the Mandela effect with some standard animation industry networking junk thrown in. Despite the look of the show, Klasky Chupo was not involved with its creation. But one of their former collaborators was. Everett Peck. The same cartoonist behind Duckman was hired as a character designer for four animated TV series for Sony Pictures, under their newly formed animation studio, Adelaide Productions. Most of these projects were short-lived, but seemed to be shows geared more towards subjects boys would be interested in. Jumanji, Extreme Ghostbusters, Men in Black, the animated series, and Godzilla, the series. There's some cool-ass monsters in that show. Also, the intro for uh, Men in Black, one of the hardest ever. I love that intro. Now, Jumanji's visual style definitely seems to be the most upfront about looking like a nod to Klasky Chupo. But again, this was just one straight-up coincidence. But one project that I truly wish was a terrible mistake was an animated miniseries commissioned by the world's biggest fast food giant. The Wacky Adventures of Ronald McDonald. Oh, buckle up. During a brief and ill-advised decision to expand on the characters of McDonald land, Klasky Chupa was commissioned to make a six-part animated miniseries to be sold as individual VHS tapes at local McDonald's restaurants. They were released between early October 1998 to late January 2003, priced at $3.50 per tape. What a bargain. Now, I'm planning on doing a deep dive video involving this bizarre series in the near future, but I wanted to make sure I included it too so I didn't leave anything out. I gotta be thorough. Uh, so keep an eye out for that one, as we'll be getting into topics including, but not limited to, the development, recycling music from Rugrats to save money, the Hamburglar getting a Tumblr sexy man makeover, Ronald's sizable dump truck ass, and the absolutely terrifying animatronic puppets from the tape intros. You've been warned. Now I see where William Afton got his influence. It's not Chuck E. Cheese, it's that, that dog right there. So, with all of these other projects in mind, their best and most loyal client was, unsurprisingly, Nickelodeon. For better or for worse. At least, that was how things seemed for a while. 
which started off as a highly symbiotic relationship, was growing stale and unexciting. And it's not like Klasky Chupo wasn't trying to make a wide variety of shows for Nickelodeon. On the contrary, they definitely were. Between the late 90s and early 2000s, Klasky Chupo started embracing the tween generation. They had three distinct series that all incorporated the same kind of slice of life dynamic, but for different audiences. We have the Wild Thornberries, an educational adventure show following the life of 12-year-old Eliza Thornberry and her family as they travel around the world producing nature documentaries. I, I actually watched the premiere of this when I was a kid, along with Cousin Skeeter. I will never forget that night. It was, it was something. Secretly, Eliza can talk to animals and uses her powers to help protect the local ecosystem in a number of exotic locations. Like, I really appreciate their dedication to showing off a wide variety of animals that kids may not otherwise have any exposure to. Also, let's just give it up. You know, I'm gonna clap right now. Uh, let's give it up for the man himself, the legend, Nigel Thornberry. Ah, Marianne. <laughs> You know, just, just for being himself. Uh, voiced by Tim Curry, no less. What a legendary dynamic. Rawr. Nobody threatens a Thornberry. <laughs> what, a, what a design. Look at this guy's nose. The, the most British character who ever lived. Marvelous. The great giant elephant. Oh, 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 oh. But if that is not your speed, then get ready for rocket power. Bum, 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 shoobies. <laughs> uh, Rocket Power was an action comedy show following the lives of Otto, Reggie, Twister, and Squid. Four friends living in Southern California and their adventures dabbling in extreme sports and eating uh, microwavable burritos at the gas station. Originally broadcast from August 16th, 1999 to July 30th, 2004, it is a very youth-oriented show designed for the sporty crowd who were all into the latest trends and fads of the early 2000s. BMX bikes, inline skating, street hockey, razor scooters, you know, that sort of thing. They also really leaned into the kids using a ton of slang that feels super dated by today's standards with words like chuby and dank. But then again, today's standards are like, you know, Ohio and and Riz and uh, On God. I, I, maybe we're all old. It's all a passing thing, whether it be Shoebies or or On God. You know, I can't complain that much. Though I gotta say, the way they say Shoebies in that show, it almost feels like a slur. We've been invaded by Shoebies. And last but not least, we have my personal favorite from this era, as told by Ginger. Broadcast from October 25th, 2000 to November 14th, 2006, the story follows Ginger Foutley and her friends as they navigate the perils of junior high, social issues, cliques, family problems, etc. Rewatching this show now, it's kind of remarkable how seriously they treat the characters and their individual arcs. Uh, personally, I see it as the sister's show to Craig Bartlett's Hey Arnold which also put a ton of attention into exploring what makes their characters tick. Uh, you got a rich, popular girl who's not a mean-spirited stereotype and takes an active interest in the lead protagonist? Wow, uh, look, there she is. It's Courtney. It can be done, and it's in this show. One of the most notable features of As Told by Ginger is the characters progressing from one school year to the next, so viewers can literally age along with them every season. Right down to changing clothes every episode, I don't think I've ever seen another show give their cast so many outfit options. It's a ton of extra work to put in, as most cartoon characters are shown wearing the same clothes to cut down on expenses. But it makes their world feel so lived in, like they're real people with changing taste and styles. Each series had their own fan bases, some being more outspoken than others but none of them got to the same levels that Rugrats did. Without intending to, Klasky Chupo had pigeonholed themselves into one style of entertainment. Public perception led fans to believe that any media Klasky Chupo was behind was going to be geared towards children. So I think that really impacted their ability to branch out to new audiences. Not to mention the executives and Nick getting tired of Klasky Chupo's visual style for character designs. 
While it's definitely iconic, they've gotten a fair amount of criticism in the past for their character designs being divisive. Sometimes they've been called downright ugly. I couldn't tell you why Eliza has a peanut-shaped head or why Bernice from Duckman is so dummy thick, but their silhouettes are still very memorable. And yeah, they're not going to be everybody's cup of tea. It's a visual style that definitely takes some getting used to. But I think it also carries on the same grungy aesthetic that felt so distinct to the 1990s. Like, you don't see this stuff anymore. By the early 2000s, a lot of the most popular shows on Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon's biggest rival, also leaned into distinctive styles. Johnny Bravo, The Powerpuff Girls, Dexter's Lab, and Samurai Jack all used cleaner, extra-thick lines for their characters. It was a bold but familiar throwback to animation in the 50s and 60s, like at UPA and Hanna-Barbera. These outlines looked especially good when used with digital animation. They were also easier to draw and helped the colors pop separate from the background. Now, this trend has only gotten more popular, but subsequently made Klasky Chupa's visuals stand out for all the wrong reasons. Unfortunately for them, change was around the corner, and it would bring the eventual downfall of this once mighty studio. Bike. I earned it with my paper route. It was still usable. I only bent the handlebars a little, and that was on account of what you did to my skateboard. Skateboard! Skateboard! As we moved into the 2000s, this is when Klasky Chupa would really start to begin winding down. But not before taking one final stand to see if Tommy and the crew could still be the hits they originally were. By 2001, Rugrats had begun to wane in popularity. In 1999, a certain yellow sponge had come along, completely taking Nickelodeon's audience by storm, and very much so changed the hierarchy in terms of popularity for the network. Hell, even Jimmy Neutron was outranking Rugrats in the ratings. But still, Rugrats was a valuable IP for Nickelodeon, and Klasky Chupo had delivered their fair share of hits for the network up to that point. So, in 2001, Nickelodeon decided to celebrate the 10th anniversary of Rugrats by producing the TV special Rugrats All Growed Up. Side note, but um, All Growed Up is the name of the special, and All Grown Up is the name of the series spinoff. Is it brand consistent? Uh, sure, but it's also confusing and kind of lazy? Yeah, it's, it's lazy. Anyway, the special would start with our usual cast of characters watching a sci-fi movie about a time machine and attempting to jerry-rig their own out of a karaoke machine. It seemingly works, as the story jumps 10 years in the future, where we see the characters dealing with typical pre-teen problems, like having crushes and getting grounded. The special was a massive hit. Like, by the way, I, I was waiting for the special as a kid. It was so incredibly hyped. Everybody wanted to see it. This was a global event, at least to me and my friends. Nickelodeon aggressively marketed the crap out of it, touting the special as a can't-miss event. In the lead-up to the release, they even put out a two-VHS set as the 10 best episodes as voted on by fans, calling it the Decade in Diaper Set. Hell, one of my writers on this piece remembers having to be out of town the night it was airing and begging and pleading with his grandfather to tape it for him because Nickelodeon was pushing it as this one-time thing so much that he was scared he'd never get the chance to see it again if he missed it. Now that is what I call effective marketing. All Growed Up was a massive rating success for Nickelodeon, premiering in the coveted post-Kids Choice Awards time slot. All Growed Up would amass 12 million viewers. Nickelodeon's president at the time, Herb Skinnell, declared it was the network's Super Bowl. What was supposed to be a one-time thing was very quickly ordered to become a full series the very next day. And yeah, that makes sense. A lot of the kids who were babies or toddlers when Rugrats first aired had outgrown the show, but weren't so old that they completely forgotten about it. The chance to see the same characters age with them is such a rarity in cartoons that it's no wonder the special did so well. And Nickelodeon wanted more of it, bringing Klasky Chupo back into their good graces. All Grown Up, which is what the series would eventually be called, went into production almost immediately and premiered on April 12, 2003. 
At first, All Grown Up was a massive hit for Nickelodeon, bringing in big ratings for the network. To separate it from Rugrats, All Grown Up would ditch the two 11-minute stories format and instead focus on one 22-minute long narrative. This change gave the characters new conflicts and personalities rooms to breathe and develop. The show would also go through slight aesthetic changes over time as well, in order to age with the audience. Being mindful of their character's original legacy, Klasky Chupo wanted to avoid any issues that were too serious for All Grown Up. Instead, stating that their other show, as told by Ginger, would be their outlet for those types of stories. As a result, Ginger is 100% the better show, as the characters are afforded a lot more depth and conflict. Seriously, try rewatching it now. I'm genuinely blown away at how well it handles interpersonal conflict and real problems teenagers face. In contrast, all grown up is growing up in aesthetics only and oftentimes feels scared to do anything real with its characters. The title itself remained just a marketing gimmick. All frosting, no cake. All grown up would end up taking a massive ratings hit over its five season run though, and it appears to have run into some production problems as well. Now there is no official source for this, but in doing research, I fell down a rabbit hole of Reddit threads where people discuss what went wrong with the show and brought up that after season three, Nickelodeon released the show in a strange way. There would be a stretch of episodes released normally, followed by weeks, sometime month-long gaps or large batches of episodes would drop all at once, followed by more silence. Hey, check it out. Uh, all Grown Up technically did the Steven Bomb before Steven Universe. For instance, the show would lose its prime time slot and instead be shoved too early in the mornings on Saturdays. We're talking like 6.30 in the morning early. What kid is even up by that time? In fact, Nickelodeon held on to the final 17 episodes and just sort of unceremoniously dropped them between 2007 and 8 during this no man's land time slot. Now, like I said earlier in the video, Arlene and Gabor are not the types to air their dirty laundry to the public, so we'll never fully know what happened with All Grown Up. But it is obvious that something behind the scenes, whether it was the network meddling or an issue within Klasky Trupo itself, had a profound effect on the show's success or lack thereof. While it's hard to nail down an official timeline, what we can somewhat piece together may even imply that Arlene and Gabor were gone while the show was still technically in production. Either way, the once mighty diaper titan would limp its way to the finish line. By 2008, Nickelodeon had changed in a lot of ways. They were growing up and evolving more than the Rugrats characters were. The shows that built it had ended. The types of shows it produced changed wildly, and the executives who originally decided to work with Klasky Chupo were gone as well. With their exit, it seems like loyalties were also absent. The executives at Nickelodeon decided to end their long-standing development deal that they had with the studio. This would end up being a massive blow to the studio. Nick was very much their ever-reliable golden goose investor. But hey, nothing lasts forever. Klasky Chupa would try their hand at a few things over the years, but none of them would seem to click the way their Nickelodeon work did. There was a webcomic about a skateboarding zombie named Ali Mongo that never went anywhere. There was also an attempt at a web series starring their logo character Splat. But like, <laughs> who wants a show about that? You know, cool logo, but, uh, but it uh, <laughs> does not exactly scream compelling character here. In 2015, Nickelodeon announced that it would begin experimenting with some of its older and dormant IP, including Rugrats. At a Comic-Con in 2016, Arlene said she would be interested in working on a reboot, so long as Gabor and Paul Germain were involved as well. Huh. Wow. She really changed her tune on that one, huh? Now, as I'm sure you figured out by now, this would all lead the way to the Rugrats 2021 CGI reboot. What's notable about this reboot is that the Klasky Chupo logo does appear on it, seemingly implying that the studio is back. Arlene, Gabor, and Paul are all listed as executive producers on it. However, it's hard to tell just how involved they actually are. After all, Gabor has quoted in the same Hype and Hyper interview mentioned earlier, brings up that he's not too keen on the look of the show, 
and he does not seem like the type to give in on something like that. It's also not uncommon for showrunners to have contracts that guarantee them executive production credits on other projects that involve worlds and characters they've created, despite having no involvement beyond getting paid. Which is a, you know, fair. Go get that bag, folks. Get that paycheck. In my research, I kept trying to find anything I could to pinpoint their involvement. But really, the only things I could find were from everyone else involved in the production besides them. According to this Variety article written by Amber Dowling, it sounds like most of the show's assets and designs are handled in-house at Nickelodeon, with the animation being outsourced to an Indian studio, Technicolor. This leads me to think that Arlene, Gabor, and Paul are likely almost entirely hands-off. But still, why slap the logo of a dead, or at best, dormant company on your new show? Unless they were actually still around in some way? Uh, I guess we'll have to wait and see on that one. So in conclusion, I think if we needed to boil down what ruined class kid Chupo, it involves a combination of factors. Number one being our main creative force, Arlene and Gabor. Now I want to be upfront that I really admire their relationship and how even in the face of their marriage falling apart, they remain kind to each other for the sake of their friendship, business, and kids. But it is apparent that the patience they afforded each other did not always extend to their staff. It's hard to look at how Gabor acted when it came to the Simpsons incident, Arlene's conflict with Paul, or the muddy history of all grown up, and not come to the conclusion that they maybe weren't the easiest people to work with. You can get away with that for a while, but it is one of those things that can continue to chip away at people over time. The other reason is, in an ironic sense, Nickelodeon. Now, what I mean by that is, I think they likely put too much of their stock into Nick. After the run on The Simpsons, six of their nine network television shows all aired on Nickelodeon. They had a pretty lucrative production deal with them that basically kept the lights on. But I think in tying themselves so closely to Nickelodeon, it would go on to define them as a studio that exclusively worked with Nickelodeon. So much so that when Nick executives would eventually get bored of them, I'd imagine it became hard to find other studios that wanted to take them on. Their main benefactor was also a major downfall to their image. You don't put all your eggs in one basket, because sometimes that basket discovers your eggs aren't selling as well, and it wants to hold a greater variety of different looking eggs. You know, some that look like sponges. Baskets are weird like that, I guess. And listen, I get it. Animation production is an incredibly hard and competitive field. When a lifeline comes along and says, not only can we make you sustainable, but also profitable, anybody's first inclination would be to get on board as fast as you can and ride that sucker out as long as you can. But I have to wonder if maybe they had spread themselves further across other networks over the years, we'd still be talking about them in a more active sense today, rather than trying to figure out if they're alive or dead. Obviously, their rise would have taken longer with that route. Hell, it very well could have just not worked out for them. But it's hard not to wonder what if. And the final reason for the fall of Klasky Chupo? Well, it's All Grown Up. All Grown Up had a lot of weight on its shoulders. Their predecessor had gone from a titan of cartoons to being constantly outranked by other shows on the network. Then in a totally unexpected twist of fate, its TV special became quite possibly the biggest thing the channel had ever aired to that point. When the full series was ordered, the pressure would be impossible to live up to, even if it had been good. But unfortunately, All Grown Up would go on to really disappoint fans, leading to declining ratings, which of course resulted in all the stuff we talked about earlier in the video. All Grown Up just played things way too safe and sanitized, isolating the group of kids who were most excited for it, who then moved on to other things that were speaking to them on a deeper level. I guess you could say the kids who once called Rugrats their friends had, hmm, all grown up. Independent of the Paramount Plus reboots, Klasky Chupo still seems to be a mostly dormant company, with no other announced projects on the horizon as of writing this. Since leaving Nickelodeon, they've tried to branch out into other ventures outside of family entertainment, including one adult-oriented film called Immigrants. I've watched it, it's not that good. It's the most recent feature film released by Klasky Chupo as a production company, 
but also has a very troubled past. The story follows two friends, Yoska and Vlad, sharing an apartment in LA and trying to pursue the American dream as Eastern European transplants. It was supposed to be a series intended for Spike TV, but was never aired after they lost their contract with Viacom, the parent company of Spike and Nickelodeon. The film was eventually released on DVD in 2008 in Hungary, with the English dub readily available on YouTube if you want to check it out. After that, Gabor eventually pivoted into film direction, working on a number of domestic and Hungarian films, including The Secret of Moonacre, Papa Pia, and The Bridge to Terabithia. Arlene seems to have some upcoming writing work related to the Rugrats reboot, but there are no real specifics just yet. It just sucks that things for Klasky Chupo have more or less ended in a whimper. But hey, it's not like that kind of growth could last forever, and they achieve the level of success any production company would dream of. Before bowing out, Klasky Chupo provided a wide variety of smartly written, funny, and entertaining shows with a signature style they could call their own. And to me, that is a definite win. Plus, I'm sure the merchandising money helps to dole the pain. Haha. <laughs> oh, Tommy Pickles toy, please give me money. Now, I still love re-watching old episodes of Rugrats, as told by Ginger, and Duckman to marvel at how one small company could earn so much success. I hope that whatever creative projects Arlene and Gabor are pursuing now are providing the same quality of entertainment I grew up with. Nickelodeon would never have been the same network without their influence, and I'm glad to know that folks still have so many fond memories of these classic shows to this day. So, I raise my bottle to Klasky Chupo, and may Stu never have to make another chocolate pudding for the rest of his life. I'm not going out at 3 in the morning to buy you chocolate pudding, and that's final. Hey folks, I just want to thank you all for making it to the end of this video. If you'd like, subscribe to the channel, like or dislike this video, and leave a comment. It really helps. And for this week's Indie Spotlight, I'm giving a shout out to Alistocrat's Hugo's Mind Palace. It gives me Steven Universe and OKKO OK vibes, cute cast, likely designs. Go check it out. It's up on YouTube. Link is in the description down below. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you all next time.